What are the specific policy initiatives that need to be put in place to make All Electric America possible? So to make uh, All Electric America possible, we need to, we need to basically, if we're going to implement laws, we need to take fossil fuels offline, about 4% to 6% a year. Uh, it's been generally said that it should be faster sooner. By year 2035, we should have 45 to 60 percent offline. By 2050, zero. Ideally, we could actually have zero by 2035. You know, that would be ideal for us. The chance of getting below 1.5, staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius is better. Um, so we need policies that take that offline. Uh, we need, we need, there are a number, there are, some states and uh, cities that have decided to become 100% renewable. And like California and um, Hawaii and um, New Jersey have all passed laws to, become, to have 100% renewable electricity by the year 2040, 2045. And, um, and so passing a law to say, okay, now it's time to have all renewable electricity, uh, Ideally, you would also pass laws to say renewable transport as well and re renewable um, heating and cooling as well and industrial processes as well so that we continue to work on it and make it doable, you know, where we can do a little bit every year, you know, not go crazy where we, you know, we don't have to panic, go into our house and take the natural gas furnace out today and put solar panels on today because, I mean, it'd be nice if we had Green Mountain Power and we could have them come in and help us do it, but we don't all have a utility or anybody to help us to that extent. So it's the same thing as a society slowly, slowly <clears throat> start taking the fossil fuels offline or quickly, but doably <laughs> take them offline and then um, begin allocating more and more resources towards clean technology, 21st century technologies. So right now all of the money that we're putting towards um, the fossil fuel infrastructure and the subsidies that that's getting and um, the Department of Defense spending we're putting towards guarding and um, transporting our oil could be allocated now to building a 21st century grid, a 21st century um, energy infrastructure. So um, we need laws that will talk about, ideally we create laws that would talk about doing that. You know, it's happening naturally as the technology becomes um, better, <laughs> you know, and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, but we are a civilized society and we do pass laws and the market can't always make all of the decisions for us. So ideally, we'd pass some laws to do this as well. You know, the market didn't decide to go fight fascism and get hit, you know, make sure that we dealt with um, Hitler in World War II and we passed civil rights laws and um, extended the right to vote laws and those weren't decided by the market and fighting and securing ourselves from climate change isn't necessarily going to be decided by uh, the market. The market can't say, oh, we have climate change and, um, you know, the, the, the sea level rise will be so much so that it's going to go up to the Statue of Liberty's elbow if we don't do something about it. The market doesn't know that. We know it. So we need to pass laws to, to secure ourselves. So in, just in case that technology doesn't happen fast enough, which could, ha you know, could happen in a blink of an eye and we'll all, all be saved, but it could not. <laughs> How can or should the U.S. lead in social policy towards effective climate change? Well, the U.S., as we move to clean technologies, the rest of the world will follow because we are... Um, cultural leaders, we are technological leaders, uh, we have a lot of really smart, cool people in our country, a lot of really smart, cool people from all over the world that come here. And we innovate and we think about um, making a better future. So as we move from 20th century technology, the rest of the world will do it. Right now, China is. They're actually, China's actually leading in solar manufacturing and so, um, in the solar industry. They're actually leading in, leading in wind as well. Denmark is a leader as well. 
but U.S. is usually third in wind manufacturing with GE. But China has a lot of companies in electric vehicles. China is also a leader in electric vehicle manufacturing. So we're not the only ones, but the U.S. should definitely um, be the ones to start implementing this. If we pass laws, we can also help do that. And we can also, there's a million people without electricity right now. Uh, those million people can skip the age of Edison completely. Uh, there is um, the late Jim Rogers. He passed away recently. He was Duke Energy CEO, and I had spoken with him, and he talked about, he had wrote a book, uh, Lighting America. Um, or not Lighting America, sorry, Lighting the World. And he talked about how those communities could run on solar energy and um, have microgrids, and that it's actually better for them rather than bringing lines in from central generation somewhere in, in their countries. And we can also be leaders in that too and, and promote this technology that uh, will, be, will bring a cleaner, safer, um, and better future um, for our en better energy future for all of us. So we should be involved, obviously, in the climate talks, United Nations climate talks. And we should be involved in that because that's the future uh, of the world. And we can, we can do that. How is clean technology a resource? What's really neat is that clean technology is an amazing resource. Uh, we have thought about clean technology or moving to solar and wind because we have to because of climate change, because we're going to be doomed, you know, if we don't. But the truth is that we should be moving to clean technology even if there were no climate change. I mean, maybe we will be because of the technology, but really we should be, because it will be cleaner, it'll be cheaper, cheaper, it'll be safer. Um, one way is you can think about the hydroelectric dams as an example, our, our solar and wind technology are like our hydroelectric dams and will gain the ben great same benefit from those. And anybody who gets energy from hydroelectric dams and electricity for them knows what a great resource those dams are. Um, you know, basically uh, the dams were put up and they cost a lot of money to build, but an, an amazing amount of innovation and progress happened around those dams. Uh, first of all, you could clean up the air a bit and, um, or a lot from the dams, but then electricity is so cheap. So a lot of industry, a lot of places would come and come around the dams. A lot of industry, a lot of progress, a lot of innovation happens around the dams because the energy is so cheap. Because once it is built, the fuel is free and then it's flowing and then you have really cheap electricity. So the same thing will be with your solar and wind technology. You build it and, and people say, oh, it's so expensive. No, it's cheap actually, but, um, you build it and, and then it starts producing electricity without the fluctuating costs of uh, fuel. You don't have to worry about that, the transport of fuel. You have the sun, we have the sun. It's amazing, you know, and, and I think that's, um, that's us for humans, it's the future. Take that, that amazing nuclear reaction happening, you know, up in, up in space is giving us a, an enormous amount of energy, and it's also fueling the movement of the air, giving us wind. So um, that's a resource. There's an amazing health resource because of, of the air pollution that comes from it as well. There's a, one of, it's one of the leading causes of death is, is air pollution from biofuels and um, um, fossil fuel burning and, and, and what have you. Um, and then you can also, it's a resiliency. It, it allows for resiliency. Our, our cities can have their own microgrids. We can have our own energy generation, community solar projects. Uh, <clears throat> somebody told me, and just told me about how in Puerto Rico, it was the community um, building that had solar panels on the roof that everybody was coming to after the hurricane to charge up their oxygen tanks and and their medical devices that they needed. Uh, so many of the vital functions we have can still be operating. Same thing what you happened in New York uh, when the hurricane came. There was, um, uh, you know, you needed vital services, vital functions, and microgrid can provide that. So it can provide for a city. Um, your state 
if your state has its, has its own generating capacity, obviously it can. Um, your state can provide for the state and then your individual communities and towns and cities can also uh, um, have microgrids and then you can even have a home and your home has its own little microgrid. All of these things create resiliency. And then, of course, it's a national defense uh, resource because, again, with the microgrid, and then uh, we can pay for the, um, our fuel here at home. We don't have to pay tons of money to protect oil interests abroad and all of the shipping and transport of them and all of the affiliated wars that we're having. Uh, we won't necessarily get rid of those <laughs> now, but um, it will reduce the, that impact. So the important thing to think about with um, renewable energy and clean technology is that this is an amazing resource. We should want to move in this direction even if there were no climate change. Like this is, this is great. I would love my house to have its own micro, small mini microgrid. We've had, we just had the power out a few weeks ago and we were out of power for two days. Um, and so uh, this, would, this would be something, so when we talk about renewable energy, it doesn't need to be um, something that we just think for climate change and it doesn't need to be just a left wing, let's say, agenda. This is, should be something, this should be par bipartisan, something that we all want. And we should be, we can talk about it as a resource rather than just something we have to do. Like, oh, this is something we have to do. Like, no, you know, this is something we want to do. What does a snapshot of the, the near future look like? So the snapshot of the future is really a fun thing to think about. Uh, we will have cleaner air, uh, our houses will be cleaner, and we will have more resilient, um, uh, resilient cities and resilient homes for energy. I mean, it's, we'll, we just have a snapshot of a better energy future. I don't think our lives will change that much. Uh, we will just have um, more, let's say, democratization of energy rather than the energy just coming from central generation. It will be distributed everywhere. It'll be on our houses and it'll be on our churches and on our, on our other worshiping um, facilities. It'll be on our, our city halls or where have you. And, and it will be cheaper, cleaner, safer. We'll have less health issues. I mean, we will we'll see asthma go down. We'll see, um, <clears throat> various health issues go down. I mean, it'll be, it's just moving from the 20th century. You know, we had, I know in Chicago, uh, my dad said when he was in school there uh, that he'd open his windowsill and just, you could just wipe the soot off the windowsill. It's kind of like that. You know, we've cleaned up the soot to some extent. We put scrubbers in our coal power plants to make them cleaner, but they're not. They're still producing carbon dioxide and solar and natural gas plants. So we're not always, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing the soot always, but we're feeling it. We're feeling the impact. So what we'll do is we'll, the future will be just uh, better, um, better, cleaner, safer um, energy future and, and moving into the, for, it we'll be moving into the for future. And some of it will be the technology we're using today to get there isn't what we're going to be using in the year 2050 or the year 2040. We're, we're using the personal computer of 1990. I don't know, I think we're a little beyond 1985, right? But we're using that today. You know, we'll have the smartphone of, of, uh, of energy technology into the future. And so I think, I think um, if, I think if uh, we can think of it in a positive way and, and be excited about it, it it will be, um, it'll be great. And the other thing is we'll have cool things like the electric car is really fun. And if you have a home, you can charge at home uh, <clears throat> or in your garage. So you won't be going to the gas station all the time. Uh, if you don't have it, you may be able to pull up to um, um, an electric, uh, electric light or something and plug into the post. In London, I saw some, some of their lights had places where you could plug your car in. So it's really fun to be able to you just plug your car in at night and sleep, wake up, oh, it's charged, okay, and you know, you go off. I mean, there'll be some fun things, too. Uh, they may be auton drive autonomous autonomously, too, but we'll see. So I think that's where, where we'll see it. We have to think of this as a positive future um, 
as this transformation. It can be, there are some unknowns, of course, what it will be, but it will, it will definitely be um, something that I think we can all look forward to and be excited about. Thank you.